So we're going to start in John chapter 1, verse 1. I think most people are familiar with this verse. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 3, Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing has been made. Nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's interesting that the way the Bible describes the being of Jesus before He took on a body was that He's the Word of God. Genesis talks about God speaking everything into, an, into existence. So I don't know what this is akin to in the spiritual realm, but clearly the concept of words has significant weight in the Bible. John 1.14, we just talked about this, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word, God's Word, became flesh. Just let that marinate for a moment. If you could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God, if we could get beyond the intimidation and the fear, if, if you could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God and listen to what the Creator of everything, including you, would say, that is the embodiment of Jesus. Right? So when you read a story about Jesus, when you read about how Jesus responded to someone, you're reading the way God responded to someone. You're reading what God would say. And it's interesting that when it gives two descriptors here about Jesus, it does not say that He came with uh, judgment, sarcasm, condescension, condemnation. Right? The two descriptors it uses is that Jesus came uh, full of grace and truth. That's God's words. How are they described? Full of grace and truth. Matthew chapter 12. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word spoken, that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Did you notice that the Bible doesn't say that you'll be judged on your actions? Now that may be true, that we'll be judged on our actions, but what Jesus here, the spoken word of God, highlights is that you'll have to give an accounting for your words. Even the empty words. And by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. The Greek word for condemned here is condemned to death. Like a final judgment. Gets more encouraging. <laughs> Revelation 21, after we get past this one. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. It's interesting that all liars are lumped in with the things that I tend to classify as worse. I, don't, I can't speak for you, but when I read these things, they strike me as much worse than little lies. But even white lies are significant because they reduce the importance of your words. And if they reduce the importance of your words, then they reduce the importance of God's word. And we're, hopefully we're starting to see how important God's word is. So, what's the effect of words? Well, Proverbs 16, 21. The wise in heart are called discerning, and gracious words promote instruction. When your words are gracious, 
then that promotes receptivity, it promotes instruction, it promotes understanding. When your words are sarcastic, harsh, judgmental, it evokes defensiveness, guilt, insecurity, which make it difficult to learn, make it difficult to comprehend. But the wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. Proverbs 16, 23 and 24. The hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent. Their lips promote instruction. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So the wisdom of the heart makes our words prudent and our lips promote instruction. Well, how? Gracious words. Because they promote instruction like we looked at in the previous verse and here. And they're sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Now the word grace it evokes a present that you didn't deserve. Right? Our salvation is God's grace. His mercy is Jesus took our punishment. Right? Mercy is that somebody else stepped in and took the punishment that you deserved. But grace is not just that you escaped punishment, but grace is that God not only took on your punishment, but then gave you eternal salvation as if you were blameless. In fact, the Bible says that for those who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. And for me, the mental image I get is that when God looks down on the earth, He doesn't see us in this analogy. He doesn't see us for how despicable we are, he looks down and sees little Jesuses because we're all clothed in Jesus. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Proverbs 29, do you see someone who speaks in haste? There's more hope for a fool than for them. So hasty words they leave us without hope. Now that's a significantly greater cons consequence than most of us like to think because I can be very hasty in my words. I can get frustrated with one of my children and I can snap at them. I can begin to lecture them. Lecturing feels good to me. It allows me to vent and feel justified. Right? I can be hasty in my words but hasty words squash hope. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken, that was tough for me to type in, autocorrect kept making it philly. <laughs> A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Maybe think of it like this. A wisely placed word is like fine jewelry that completes the picture. So I hope that you're starting to just let this marinate a little bit. The importance of your words. If we are going to teach to our children the beauty the majesty behind God's virtue and how being virtuous leads to flourishing relationships and the well-fed calves frolicking in the fields, right? If we're going to paint the picture for our children that God wants them to see, then how we communicate it is absolutely essential. We're going to focus in on two verses as we finish up this little lesson here. Proverbs 18.21, the first part of the verse. You can read the whole verse, so I'm just going to focus on the first part. The tongue has the power of life and death. Did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, go ahead. And then Do you I'll, want me to say it now? Yeah, no, okay. go ahead. 
Well, before you get into all of life and death words, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that this is why at the beginning of the class I said, you've got to pray for wisdom. Most of us were not brought up in homes like this. I don't know about you, but my home life, if I was messing up, I usually was being made fun of, put down, a lot of sarcasm. That's how they tried to control me, you know, or try to, you know, get me to o obey. And so naturally, guess what I do? Same thing. Mm -hmm. I struggle with anger. Another scripture we didn't have in here, but please put down James 1, 20. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So when we're angry, that is not the time to train your children. Because it will not produce the fruit you want. And I'm constantly, you can ask Alex, apologizing for my anger. And it's weekly. I mean, I mess up stress. You know, life's happening, at, you know, or I don't feel good. So things happen, right? I mess up because I revert immediately back to who I am and how I was, and not blaming my parents, but just how I was brought up and these are bad habits. So humility is a must here, but I just really prayer. You gotta pray all the time to be able to speak this way to our kids. It, it, I mean, unless you're just different than us, it does not come natural. And I also wanted to share that it's so important that we are constantly praising and complimenting our kids, but there's a difference between Complimenting versus flattery. Flattery is the sin, actually. There's a scripture about it. Yeah, it's here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. But yeah. it's not appropriate to make up things. It, we have to look at the virtue. You know, we have to look at something. There's something they're doing. Whether it's a little bit of self-control that you can compliment them on. They need to feel that you believe in them. And even when they're weak, I'll say things that are more positive, which Dave is actually going to get into, so I won't go there. But it's okay. Just that Proverbs 16, 21 talks about gracious words prompt instruction. When you want to give instruction, it's really important that you've also built them up a lot that day before you're in there telling them what they need to change. So, gracious words. Awesome. Thanks, honey. Okay, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Just consider that we are the only created thing that was given the ability to speak. Right? Mm -hmm. We were given the ability to communicate. We were given emotions. I tend to think my dogs have lots of emotions, but I don't know if that's true. But we have the ability to communicate them. We can speak. But with that comes the fact that we'll be held accountable for what we do with that incredible gift. And what does it mean that your tongue has the power of life over death, uh, life and death? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the second verse I want to focus in on is Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. This has got to be, for me, one of the most challenging verses in the Bible. It might seem simple, mm -hmm. but to not let anything unwholesome, no sarcasm, no judgment, no condensation, Con no harsh language, no negative criticism, no critical political speech, jesting about the weakness of another, Flattering your children, crudeness, harsh language to make a point, belittling your spouse. Like, let nothing come out of your mouth except what is helpful for building yourself up. No, except what is helpful for building the person who has ticked you off up. Right? It's an incredible amount of self discipline, an incredibly high bar. Let nothing come out of your mouth except what is helpful for building somebody else up. Um, according to their needs. Not lifting them up in a way that you think is uh, best for you, but lifting them up in a way that, that meets their need. Now, you did a chapter on love languages or touch points of love, right? And that plays in here. The whole concept of I might feel love one way, but my children feel love another way, and so you need to implement that. Right? A quick story about love languages is Tammy uh, went through a... Um, well, her parents got divorced when she was seven. 
And as they were heading towards divorce, the relationship wasn't good, and so dad threw himself into work and was gone a lot. And he felt bad about being gone a lot, and so he was always giving his two daughters gifts. Well, fast forward many, many years, we get married, and I like giving gifts. And so I was constantly coming home and bringing little things for my wife or tickets to that or whatever, and it never went well. She wasn't rude, but it didn't go well. And it took a long time of our marriage before Tammy... This class. It, yeah, it actually this took class. this class and a long, <laughs> a long time in our marriage before she connected the dots that, you know what? When you give me stuff, it brings up all this emotion about my dad trying to buy my love or that was the impression. Right? So being attuned to your children and what, how they feel love, how they perceive love is very, very important. And it may not be how you give love. That may not be your natural propensity to giving love, but you need to get good at that so that they can have gracious words, they can feel built up, they can, have, they can be ready to learn from you. Um, Christian parents intercede as a physical example of an invisible God. Young children cannot comprehend God. They might talk about God, but they have no comprehension of God. And during that period of time, their perception of that kind of authority is you. And so if you choose to use harsh words, lecturing, you show your frustration through your words. If you choose to do that, then you're leaving an impression on them of who God is. Right? I grew up with a very prohibitive conscience. And so when I became a Christian as an 18-year-old uh, freshman in college, I did so because I did not want to go to hell. Not bad. Right? The scriptures say that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So fear has a place. But it took me years, if not a, well over a decade, before I finally started getting help in what it meant to fall in love with the being of God. And so I had this extremely prohibitive first 10 to 15 years of my Christian life because it's how I grew up. And even as an adult, I just transferred that paradigm to my understanding of God. Okay? We don't need our children to go through that. If we can represent a more accurate picture of God, does that mean perfection? Absolutely not. It means when you fail, you repent in a biblical way. You seek forgiveness. You show your children how you deal with your own weaknesses so that they can deal with theirs. Okay? But if we can show an accurate image of God, then when they, as they reach an age of accountability and begin to comprehend the nature of God, they can transfer that more accurate picture to Him. And this starts with your speech. Matthew 4, 4 says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You communicate life to your children through the words you speak. Just like God gave us life through His words and continues to give us life through the words He speaks. So ask yourself not to feel guilt or overwhelm, but are you characterized in your house by communicating virtue or are you characterized by communicating vice? At work, are you com characterized by communicating virtue or vice? In your social media, so virtuous words communicate the they communicate value and they communicate potential. They promote beauty and life because all virtue finds itself uh, finds its source in the character of God. God's the source of all virtue and therefore all virtue gets its life from God. But words of vice are part of a culture of condemnation and death. They're actually part of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Vice words are those common descriptions that communicate corruption and discouragement, defilement, and death. So here's some examples. Here's, and you've got these on your sheet, I believe. Nope. Instead of saying, that was dumb. What about saying, you know, that wasn't wise. Or that was unwise. It's a very subtle difference. But dumb is vice. And God doesn't make dumb. God makes perfect, right? He thought you were awesome. He said, I'm done with, with them. That's great. I like that. And I've created a path on which they will find me and they will get to know me. Right? Well, wisdom is a virtue. So somebody made an unwise choice. But they're not dumb. You know, you are being so mean to your sister. But what about, honey, you need to demonstrate kindness to your sister. One of them is communicating vice. You're mean. You've labeled someone, right? The other is virtue. It, it's embedded in hope. Wow. That That's oh, a choice. I can be kind. I can make a choice. I'm not mean. I made a mean choice. You are so selfish. I've said you're mean to your sister. I've said you're so selfish. I've said stop being jealous. I've said don't spill that. I don't think I've said you're dumb, but I might have. We but, don't have this, just so you know. Say again? We don't have that on our sheet. Oh, you don't? Okay. No, so, so you're so selfish. What about you need to become more generous? You do? Okay, good. Why don't I have it? The word, I don't know if the no, your examples are different than what's on here. So just okay, go ahead and well, that's okay. I'll finish this and then we'll talk about what you may have there. Um, stop being so jealous. That's tough. That's like guys do not think of a pink elephant. <laughs> right? It's tough. Pink elephant pops in your head. Stop being so jealous. No, how about you need to learn to become content. We're going to work on this together. Your child's walking across the room with a cup of milk and you say, do not spill that. <laughs> yeah. How about, hey, hun, let's see how carefully you can carry that across the room. Yeah. What does one of them communicate? One of them communicates that you think they're awesome. I have so much belief in you. You are incredible. You are a little miracle of God. And I see that you made an unwise decision, but we're going to work on making wise decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that you can be a little bit goofy and you can uh, be, a, you know, um, running across the room and being j a jokester and you can spill that milk, but let's see how carefully you can carry it today. Right? Words of virtue versus words of vice. So I hope these examples are helping to bring those scriptures into something contextual, right? Elevate the virtue, not the vice. Elevate the truth, not deception. Okay, and this is where I want to hit on flattery really quick, and then I think you have something you yeah. want to say. Okay, okay so here's what flattery is. Okay. In, in case anybody, uh, and I had no idea. Right, flattery is your child brings home a picture of a family behind with a palm tree and the sun, and after they explain it to you, you say, I see it. But you didn't see it until they explained it to you. Right? And then you say, you know what, you are the best artist. That's flattery. I used to do this with, to my children. I wanted to encourage them. It wasn't of a bad heart. You are the best artist. Your child's playing soccer, they get off the field and you say, you are the best forward. You're the best passer on the team. Well, you're not being truthful. Oh. This is coming from a good heart, but you're not being truthful. Right? And so what happens, even though you may be unaware of it as I was unaware of it? Well, your child believes your words. And then something happens where they're not the best and there's great discouragement. Or someone draws a better picture and they don't totally understand as a young child because my mom said I'm the best. And so your words begin to hold less value because you've told your child something that wasn't true. 
right? That's flattery versus integrity. Now you can still lift your child up. I am so impressed with that drawing. You've come a long way. You know, I think you really have a talent in that, if it's true. Right? I think that's something we can really develop. I mean, you can encourage your children. That's the best I've ever seen you play. If you stay on that trajectory, you could be the best on, on the team in that position or whatever, right? But there's ways to express truth and encouragement through words of vice, not words of deception, which is easy to accidentally do. You wanted to say something? Yeah. I also just want to bring up that it's important that we make things tangible. So we can say things to our kids that are very abstract. For example, be quiet. You have to ask yourself, well, first of all, that wouldn't be speaking life. There's a more beautiful way. but. If you say be quiet, does your kid even know what be quiet looks like? If you say be still, what does that mean to a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old? So you have to actually, and again, depending on the age of your child, define that. And so you have to stop and ask yourself, what does that look like? And so, for example, if you wanted your child to be still, maybe you're at the doctor's office, then you could say something like, the positive side would be, Let's get self-control, so fold your hands. Because maybe they have a lot of energy and that somehow really helps kids. Or how about we just you know, put our hands behind our back and sit in the chair. And we'll talk later about how you want to actually practice that a lot at home, mm -hmm. not out in public. But do you see the difference? Whereas if you just say, be still, be still. You know, you ever repeat things over and over? You gotta ask yourself, does your kid even know what you're saying? Have you trained them at home? First, or are you telling them all these things outside the home, expecting them somehow to suddenly have self-control and you don't train it at home? So it's important your words make sense to them. And so I would have to step back and ask myself, what does that mean? What does that look like? You need to respect me. What does that mean to a child? Even a teen, if you have older kids, what does that look like in your family? What is it going to look like? You have to actually describe it so that they understand. Does that make sense? Okay. What chapter this is in, but he tells the story about getting frustrated with his children because he would say, we need to hurry and get ready to go. Oh, yeah. And his children sort of lollygag around, and he realized that he had never trained them what that looked like. And so, if you've heard this story, stop me, but he decided that he would hide some candy, and I think he hid it under his couch cushions or something, and then he told them there was hidden candy, and he wanted them to find it, and man, they were, whoever finds it gets it, and they were voracious, right? They were fast, they were, and, and then after that, he used that to teach them, okay, this is what I mean when I say we need to hurry and be ready to go. And I think he called it, I think they ended up calling candy it three speed. candy speed or something like that. But he gave the kids a physical example of what that looked like. So it did two things. One, it gave the child a tangible, physical example of what this instruction means. But two, it allowed Gary now to no, this is what they're capable of, this is what they've been trained, this is, we both know what the expectation is, so now I know when I need to add a consequence versus not. But if you just say, I want you to hurry, we gotta go, and you've never trained that, the child doesn't really understand it, and now you're adding consequences which uh, frustrates. Okay? Um, almost done. Be careful of impulsive judgments. We're gonna talk about judgment not the judgment, but judgment at a later time. But just suffice it to say here that identifying what somebody did is not judgment, that's observation. But the moment you assume to know why they did it, you've judged. Okay? It's okay to observe the way someone spoke to someone else or the lack of three candy speed, or it's okay to observe, right? But then, out of respect for the other human being, that's where we need to, the heart is deep waters and a man of wisdom draws them out, right? That's where we have to find out and gain understanding. Then we can coach and disciple, correct, rebuke, train, okay? So knowledge is the first of three steps that leads to wisdom. Gaining understanding is the second step. And only knowledge and understanding together lead to the ability to make wise decision making. That's why God is the only one that can ever have true wisdom. It's the only one. Because true wisdom means 
you can see everything that led to this and everything that comes after it. And only in that context can God make a correct judgment. And yet, what did God do when He became flesh and lived among us? He said, I have not come to judge but to save. I'm going to live virtue and draw you to me like Orpheus playing that instrument so that you will be drawn to me through righteousness and relationship. Okay? And words matter because they impact the relationship. I mean, Those who... Example. You want to say something? Well, yeah, go ahead. Just to give you guys a quick example, let's say you go in your kid's room and their room's a mess and they share a room with someone else. And you look at the mess. You can observe the facts are the room's a mess. So you can say to your child something like, you don't care about anybody else. All you think about is yourself. You're so selfish. Those are judgments, mm -hmm. right? I've now assumed why that kid didn't do it. But what if, the, what if the kid just made a bad decision that day? They got busy and got distracted and went off. Do you see the difference? So if I, if I the facts are, I observe and say, hey, I notice your stuff is out and it's not put away. Can you help me understand why you didn't put your stuff away? I have to ask questions. But if I tell them why they didn't put it away, I've passed judgment. Do you see the difference? And that's the same with us, right, in this room. If she's not smiling at me right now, she must not like me. Maybe it's because she doesn't like my hair. I'm judging. I'm making assumptions about what she's thinking about me. What I can observe is, hey, she's not smiling. I should go ask her and see what's going on. All right, hey, how's your day? Are you doing okay? Do you see that? So, and then if she, she tells me, hey, I just don't like your hair, <laughs> then I can disciple her on that. <laughs> you need to like my hair. So, when, so, do you, so for our children, we don't want to come in with words of judgment. We want to come in with words of facts. I'm observing, I'm seeing this. You know, I, this person, like today, there was a situation with one of my daughters, and an adult walked by her, and she didn't do anything. And I asked her, I said, what, what happened? This person just walked by you, you know. You didn't greet him. Why didn't you greet them? What was going on? And so she, she was humble. She's like, I don't know. I just didn't even think about it. Okay, amen. But I could have come in and said, you are so selfish. All you think about is yourself. And I've done those, these things, okay. But So we're all going to mess up. But do you see the difference? Yeah. It's gain understanding when people do things. Get the facts before you start discipling and giving your opinion and your lecture. And that really saves the relationship too. So not judging. Okay. Those who don't seek to gain understanding will likely rush into wrongful judgment. Where there is an absence of understanding, judgment rushes in to fill the void. So consider using the phrase, I'm tempted to make a rash judgment. Will you help me to understand what you were thinking? Okay? Number of years ago, I would come home from work. My kids were very young. And when I came home from work, they would run to me. That, you know, daddy, daddy. And they wanted to show me stuff. And I would give them attention. And over time, Tammy started to feel unimportant. And it's been so long, I forget if you acted on that or if you came to me right away. But ultimately, she came to me and uh, told me how she was feeling and asked what was going on. And I was able to say, no, that's, that's not the case. And I will work on that. I, I'll come to you first. I need to make you feel important. But she wasn't unimportant to me. It's just my little children were running to me so full of excitement and I would get caught up in it and want to give to them and I wasn't being smart and I wasn't being aware, right? But that could have been one of these little foxes where she starts to feel unimportant and it starts to affect our relationship. She starts to get mad because now she's seeing everything I do through a paradigm that's based on a judgment. Okay? Super, super important. Um, so, we're done here with Acts chapter 20, 32, and then we'll talk about last week's, last, or the last two weeks, the first chapter. Acts 20, 32, just let this sink in. Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up 
and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What a rich verse. I commit to you God and the word of His grace. And that word of His grace is what can build you up spiritually and can give you an inheritance into eternal salvation among all those who were sanctified. Words matter. So we're going to talk about a respect for authority here in a second, but I, I felt compelled to share this, right, because the temptation can be to go home and start implementing authority. Right? This is what it looks like. This is what I expect. But I, I really want you guys to contemplate, which is why I put that into a, a handout. And we'll put it on the website too. But to really think about how are you going to communicate these virtues. Words matter. Okay? 